Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at this 1984 Condor power supply for an old arcade machine. A friend of mine collects and restores these arcade machines, and he's been having a lot of trouble repairing this specific power supply. And he asked me if I could take a look at it and see what's going on with it. It ended up being a fairly interesting story with some surprises along the way that I thought would be cool for us to take a look at. Now, we do have the schematic of this. So the first thing is we should take a look at the schematic because this power supply has some really unusual characteristics and many things can go wrong with it that we can analyze just by looking at the schematic. Let's start from there. So let's take a look at the schematic of our power supply and see what its limitations are and where it could potentially have a cascade failure. Now we're going to look at it at a very high level just to understand the sub blocks. Now one of the nice things about working on a power supply that's so old is that everything is made of discrete devices. There are no ICs to control anything and there are disadvantages of that as well which we will see. We do have the AC line coming over here on the left side. We do have a slow blow fuse, which by the way does nothing to protect the rest of the circuit. That's really going to protect everything outside of the circuit in case of a catastrophic failure. By the time this blows, everything is dead anyway. We do have a common one inductor or class Y capacitors. There is an NTC in here for some soft, sp soft start so they don't have a huge rush and everything. That all looks good. And then we do have a full bridge rectifier. And this is actually made of discrete individual diodes. It's not even in one package. Then we do have our two big capacitors that are going to store that huge amount of charge required the reservoir so that you can feed the DC-DC converter here with a really nice low impedance. So far, this is basically the same as pretty much any other power supply. Then we do have two really large set of resistors in here to create a voltage drop and this is going to be required for the startup. So once you plug this in, this capacitor is going to begin to charge and that's going to provide some voltage over here. There is a Zener diode in here which is directly connected here to the base of this transistor. And if you look at this base of this transistor, that's our main switching transistor. Now you notice this is an NPN. Remember this is 1984, so they didn't have access to the state-of-the-art CMOS devices that we have. You can now buy a 600 volt N-channel device with an on resistance of about a few milliohms and build a really efficient power supply. Or even build a gallium nitride based switching transistor which can handle much larger voltages and much higher switching speeds making the inductors smaller and everything much more efficient. But again, you cannot do this in here. So they're using an NPN transistor. So the idea is that when you plug this in, this NPN transistor will have some charge allowed for it to start turning on and once it starts turning on it's going to pass current through this side of the transformer that's going to induce a whole bunch of magnetic flux it's going to create current on this side of the transformer and that's going to kick start the entire startup circuitry and that is really important because once it starts it's going to stabilize itself with a really large feedback network on the outside over here we have our oscillator cross couple transistor and a whole bunch of control circuitry in here which are going to create a negative feedback there's an optocoupler right here, so you can see the optotransistor on one side, and then we have the emitter on the other side. This is in one package, a very simple opto-isolator. And there is actually a 5-volt reference voltage in here, which is being fed from here, and this is our 5-volt, 12-volt amp output. So that's going to create a loop. So if you draw more current on this side, the voltage is going to drop. This is going to push more flux into this is going to stabilize itself and this is a feedback network over here all of these needs to work for this thing to actually start up and do the right thing now there are significant limitations on the low voltage side we'll get to that but let's think about what a cascade failure will do to this kind of circuit now this power supply is supposed to work from 120 volt or 240 volt there's actually a jumper wire that you can move around in order to make it work for the higher voltage but let's assume here where i am in north america we're running it at 120 volts so as soon as you plug this in there's going to be a large voltage across these capacitors, right? Much more than 120 volt, because 120 volt is RMS. Now look what happens over here. This voltage sitting on this side of the transformer is on the high side. And if you look over here and follow this, you can see that the bottom, this emitter, goes through this inductor over here, and there's a very small resistor in here, 0.39 ohm. This is basically just a current monitoring resistor here at the bottom. So which means that when you turn this on, Assume this transistor is turned off for a second. The voltage between the collector emitter of this transistor is as high as the entire rectified voltage. So therefore, this transistor has to be able to handle that entire voltage and not break down. So imagine for a second that this transistor fails and we are unlucky and it fails as a short, which means that as soon as you plug this in, there's a short circuit between the emitter and the collector. So look what happens. The entire high voltage goes through here, goes through this part, through this part, it appears here, 
it appears here and it's going to go through this because it's going to destroy that transistor and then this entire section is going to get exposed to the entire voltage of these capacitors and it's going to blow everything here so basically you're killing this entire bottom half of the circuit if this thing is a short so this is a catastrophic cascade failure because all these devices here at the bottom in this design they all can handle 30, 40 volt maximum across their various junctions. More than that, and you blow them. And if you blow them and these also blow as shorts, then there is additional short circuit paths, basically killing the cross-coupled transistor oscillator, doing this, killing this feedback transistor, killing the opto-isolator, potentially this SCR over here. Everything is going to get destroyed, all because this was a short circuit. Now, other things can happen as well. If there are other problems and this switch actually doesn't fully switch on, if the base over here turns on, this is still going to create essentially a short between the collector and emitter. It's going to turn it on hard. And if the startup circuitry doesn't quite start or something's wrong with it and it doesn't have the ability to modulate the base voltage, that's going to do the same thing. It's going to blow everything here. Now, what I would have done in a design like this is at least build some kind of a clamping circuitry in here and that clamping circuitry could have a fuse in these critical places that if the voltage exceeds the breakdown of this bottom half at least you would blow that fuse and try and protect this but there's no clamping in here at all so this is going to self-destruct as soon as you have a short circuit over here now this can happen of course if this transistor fails and i think that's probably what must have happened the first time they tried to do this but unfortunately when they were trying to repair it they were doomed from the start for a very specific reason which I will show you and actually go really down into the detail of what went wrong, why they would have never been able to fix this when they were trying it. Let's also pay attention a little bit on the right side. If you look, there are no voltage regulators on the right side of this circuit. Everything is single diode rectified. Now this portion, the 5 volt portion, is okay because even with a single diode to rectify it, you know, this is a big capacitor in here, yes, it would have some ripple, but at least it has the feedback circuitry to stabilize this voltage at 5 volt. So you draw more current, it's going to restabilize itself. But look at what's going on here. Because there is no regulator here on the 12 volt and on the minus 5 volt, what's going to happen is that this voltage is basically at the mercy of the magnetic flux of this transformer. So think about what happens. You draw more current from 5 volt. This is going to push more current into the transformer to stabilize the 5 volt, but that means that this voltage is just going to rise. So this voltage is purely at the mercy of the current consumption of the 5 volt output. The same for the minus 5. They're just going to get dragged around as much depending on the current that you draw from this. So this is one of those situations that whatever system you connect to this, has to all kind of take that into account because these voltages are free to move wherever they want. And we will measure this and I'll show you that that's in fact exactly what's going to happen. That as you draw more current from 5 volt, this voltage is just going to go higher and higher. That's a problem. But again, that's cheap because you don't have a voltage regulator or anything in here. That's the penalty for such a simple circuit. You do have some LC filters in here to clean things up. But as you can see, it's a remarkably simple circuit at the end of the day. The feedback makes it a little bit complicated and the startup circuitry is a bit complex. But in terms of design, it's as basically as basic as you could get it. If they had put voltage regulators in there, I actually don't know if in 1984 what kind of voltage regulators you could have. But that's the penalty to pay for making only one of your pads have feedback. So let's go and take a look and see why this was doomed uh, to for repair from the very beginning. Now that we have taken a look at the schematic, we can appreciate why I had to replace almost every component on the low voltage side to get this up and running. I also had to replace the main NPN transistor. So let's take a look at this and identify the components. So here's our NPN switching transistor, first transformer, the main transformer, full bridge rectifier and the reservoir capacitor, startup circuitry over here, oscillator there, up to isolator for the feedback, everything on the left of this are the low voltage unregulated outputs, all of our Schottky diodes are over there, and that's it, filtering and everything else, AC line coming in here. Now when they send me this power supply, they also send me a bag of replacement components that I could just play around with and figure out. So I used those to replace all of these, and then they also had sent me a bag of replacement transistors for this main NPN. But when I held one in my hand, and I was comparing it to a dead one. First of all, the terminals were a different color, but that's not necessarily an issue, but they felt different. The original one seemed heavier, and it sounded a bit more solid. So I became a bit suspicious about, about this particular transistor. So let's take a look at the data sheet of this and maybe analyze this a little bit more, because I think there is more to it. Before I went ahead and turned this on, I started doing this. Let me show you. And here's the data sheet for this particular transistor used on the switching power supply, the MJ12005. And if you look over here, it does have a very critical 
performance metric, the absolute maximum rating between the collector emitter, even with the base open, is 750 volts. And this is a bit of an overkill, but it's necessary, especially if you run this power supply from, let's say, a 220 or 240 volt AC coming in, the voltage appearing on this transistor is going to be quite large. So you can see it can do, you know, 8 amps or whatever, 100 watt power dissipation, so it should have a pretty good thermal profile to handle that. So now that we know this, let's go and compare these two transistors, the broken one from the original power supply and one from the bag of the new ones. Oh, by the way, you may ask, why does this have such a high breakdown voltage? Well, look at the application. The application is for CRT deflection circuits, where you could potentially come across these really large voltages in the deflection circuitry. So yeah, it does have a specific use cases. They're just using it for a switching power supply. So let's weigh two of these transistors and see how they compare. We're going to use this turbo scale here, which is a really, really nice unit, by the way. Here we go. So let's measure one of them. Let's see what do we get. So this one is about 11.18 grams or so. Okay. Let's try the other one. This is the one that came from the bag with many of them in there. And look at that. This one is 9.26 grams. So it's, you know, quite a bit lighter. And you can even feel that when you hold it. So there is something going on in there. So I suggest that now we remove the cap from the top and compare one of the dead ones that originally came from the power supply and one of the ones from this bag of mystery ones. And let's see what they look like on the inside. And removing the cap from the transistor tells us everything that we need to know. The transistor on the right is fake, and the one on the left is a damaged one from the original power supply. Now, when we looked at the data sheet of this transistor, you saw that the collector emitter breakdown voltage was very large, you know, over 1,000 volts. And that's important in a power supply like this. You know, it's a little bit of an overkill, but you need that because that voltage shows up across the transistor when you plug it in. And look at this. Look at the size of this die compared to the size of this one. And you can see that burnt mark on it from the original power supply that has been damaged. There's also a thermal pedestal, a piece of metal copper most likely underneath it, which is going to help with the heat dissipation because this thing should be able to dissipate a lot of power, I think up to 100 watts or so. This one doesn't have that. And that explains the difference in the weight is that additional metal inside for the thermal profile. So basically what they do with this, this is that they take like a blank package like this and they drop in a very basic the cheapest NPN transistors they can find and they put that in there and when you measure it with the multimeter it's going to look fine because it's just a junction it's going to look perfectly okay you're not running a complete IV characteristic to figure out where it works and where it doesn't and then they just put it in and if you order it they're just going to stamp on top of it the part number that you want it's the same thing for anything they sell they don't care and of course you plug it in in this situation, you turn it on, the VCE, the breakdown of this is probably 50 or 60 volts. It instantly becomes a short circuit, goes in the cascade failure, and destroys everything on the power supply. And the people who were trying to repair this, they were doomed to repeat this cycle because there was no way to avoid it as long as they were using these transistors from this bag of multiple of them they had. Unfortunately, that was the, the only way to fix it is to not use these transistors anymore. And that's why I discovered by looking at it a little bit closer. But yeah, now we know what happened. So now that the power supply is repaired, let's do a quick test on it. And let me also show you what happens to the unregulated outputs and if our assumptions were correct about how this would behave under various load conditions. So I have it connected to an electronic load over here. The 5 volt output is sitting over there. Right now the power supply is off. Of course, we're measuring nothing. But then I'm going to turn it on and draw 5 amps from it, Okay, which is well within its capabilities. And on the left here, I have the monitoring of the 12 volt output, one of the unregulated outputs. So the power supply is turned off right now. Let's turn it on. Here we go. It kick starts on. And look at that. We're, we, I adjusted it to 5.2 so that we have a little bit of margin normally when you plug this in depending on the cable. So I put it a little bit higher than 5 volts. And right now we're drawing no current. And look over here. The 12 volt output is not even close to 12 volt. It's 10.8. But look what happens when I draw current from the 5 volt supply. 5 amp of it. Here we go. Here's 5 amp. By the way, this drop is because of the IR drops in this. But look at that. That's now sitting at 15.8 volts. So it's just completely at the mercy of the 5 volt output because it's tied to the same transformer and there is no real regulation. And that's just the way it operates. Now remember that we're not drawing any current from this. But once you do draw current from this, this will drop. And it will go down probably around the 12 volt where it's supposed to be. So this power supply relies on all of its ports consuming the rated currents once it's put into an application. If it were me, I wouldn't use this power supply in the arcade. I would just get another one. This is nothing special. But if you really want to keep the authentic look of it, then yeah, you'd want to put this one back. By the way, in terms of efficiency, right now we're drawing about 25 watts from the power supply, and it's burning 38 watts. It is terrible. For a switching power supply, it's a horrible efficiency. But I think it might get a little bit better at the higher 
consumption once you connect everything it might get a little bit closer but this is a pretty bad situation for a power supply and if I turn it off completely and draw no current from it I am drawing about idle 6.8 watts that's also pretty terrible but yeah it works and there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this repair. I thought it was an interesting investigation, figuring out that we had a fake transistor with a cascade failure that would just be doomed to repeat itself. I thought it was an interesting diagnosis. Hopefully you also enjoyed it as well. Let me know in the comment section if you ever had experience with receiving fake transistors and so on. And if you know a good place to buy these old ones, leave it in the comment section so other people can also find it and benefit from it. As always, I'll see you next time.